I dwell in possibility. A fairer house than prose. <clears throat> More numerous of windows superior for doors. Of chambers as the cedars impregnable of eye. And for an everlasting roof the gambrels of the sky. Of visitors the fairest for occupation this the spreading wide my narrow hands to gather paradise. <laughs> the little bell of Amherst, wren small, with bright eyes, the color of sherry left by the guest at the back of the bottom of the glass, coils of rich auburn hair covering her wildly original brain as it rewove both world and time and gathered paradise. Rarely living a leaving home after the age of 30, she traveled the aeons as well as the acres of the worlds further and deeper than anyone in her time. Her life was one of the richest and deepest ever lived on American <coughs> continent. All pity for her starved life is misdirected. <laughs> no frustrated little frump was she but a poet of massive passion who took her power in her hand and went against the world. Her love life was immense and almost entirely taken up with the adoration and the illumination of this remarkable world. So intense is her passion and her obsession with the world's beauty, the slant of light, the slant of light on a winter day, the still brilliance of a summer noon, the sound of the wind before the rain, that she cracks open our perceptions, this half-cracked poetess of Amherst, and shocks our insights into being. She gives us new mind. When we were content with our old one, she forces us to value ourselves as givens, givens of brain and body before and beyond any educational additions. Our brains are peers of God, she says. The brain is wider than the sky. For put them side by side, the one, the other, will contain with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea. Behold them blue to blue. The one, the other, will absorb as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God. For heft them pound for pound, and they will differ, if they do, as syllable from sound. Mm -hmm. oh. Emily's syllables were volcanic, life-releasing magma, magma that poured new landscapes into literature. And thus, I think that she is a worthy companion from the woman's side to Romy. <laughs> so let us visit her now this Vesuvius at home. <laughs> you, come, you come into Amherst and you turn left on Seeley Street. Some of you have gone there, yes? Yes. And then you go right on Main. The driveway is at the end of a yellow picket fence. The house is somewhat hidden by a um, high hedge of cedars. Behind that hedge is the house itself, a brick mansion built by her grandfather early in the 19th century with a full complement of wings and porches, old majestic trees, and emerald lawns. It is an affluent, satisfied, apple of the eye kind of house. The kind of total home in which one can live forever and from which one could rebuild the world. You catch sight of Emily's own garden and it's wonder strange. I mean, not just for the rare and ebullient blossoms it nurtures, but for the curiosa it contains, calla lilies and pomegranates and things that only grow in other climes. How did Emily ever manage to coax these inhabitants of other shores to root in New England soil? The same way that she coaxed eternity to take up housekeeping in her own mind. Indeed, you feel yourself brushed by eternity as you enter the house. It is a nested place, and more than one world is present here. There is a sea and mermaids in the basement and frigates on the upper floor. <laughs> the smell of Emily's gingerbread baking breathes through the house and her jellies bubble over the wood stove. 
a practical woman, Emily, one who can do many things, cook, bake, garden, nurse, sew, mend. We climb the stairs and we find her room, the room that was for her freedom, the room in which she married eternity. There it is, the biggest and best bedroom in the house, a sunny, merry corner room overlooking the comings and goings of Amherst on Main Street. And from this window, you can see life whole, gossipy neighbors, bees and birds, circuses and caravans, and let us not forget cattle fairs, the nocturnal passage of lovers and drunks, mm -hmm. the grim regularity of the hearse going by, the playing children, the pompous visitors making their stately way to the door, and always, always the cycling of the seasons the eternal dialogue between death and resurrection of nature. We look around the room. Her white dress hangs in the closet, her neat iron bed in the corner, her books lie on the shelves, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Aurora Lee, a woman's poet, narrative poem of a woman's poet's life. Also Shakespeare, the Bible, George Eliot, Emerson, Carlyle, Charlotte and Emily Bronte, much thumbed lexicon. There is Emily herself. You see her? You see her with her wild eyes and precise, careful hands fashioning poems at her small table. And there she sits in this white curtain, high ceiling room, writing poems about volcanoes, earthquakes, <laughs> deserts, suicide, passions, wild beasts, power, madness, separation, demons, dooms, dreams, and death. There she binds with a darning needle batches of her poems into bundles, where one day when she leaves us, they will be discovered by her sister Lavinia, slowly but surely published, and the world will have turned a corner. But for now, an adamant anonymity. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? <laughs> then there's a pair of us. Don't tell, they'd advertise, you know. <laughs> How dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog. To tell one's name, the lifelong June, to an admiring bog. <laughs> but then, she will tell us in a letter, I'm so amused at my own ubiquity. <laughs> the house... The house has a muchness in it. This house contains its generations, moving as something more than ghosts throughout its rooms. There's grandfather, Samuel Fowler Dickinson, a manic Puritan, once a distinguished and wealthy lawyer, but fired by religious passions, hell-bent to devote all his life and substance to the creation of a seminary college for missionaries, the future Amherst College. His mad excesses of devotion will cause the family to lose the homestead for years, drive all but one son as far away across the continent, actually to Seattle, there's lots of Dickinsons there. See him stalking the halls, a flaming zealot for religion and education, convinced he was the one to bring the kingdom of God upon the earth, the city upon the hill at Amherst. From here, he was convinced he would start the fierce piety raging that would accomplish the conversion of the whole world to evangelical Puritanism and Trinitarian theology. As the promised monies fail to come, he boards the workers on the college in his own house, sends his own horses and laborers to draw the brick, and even goes himself rather than the work should ever stop. He loses his status, his wealth, his power, and his final bitter days in Amherst are an unrelieved nightmare of despondency and humiliation. The years of grandfather blink out, and other years and faces take their place. Emily's father, Edward Dickinson, a man who from his father's experience has become phobic for failure, a complex man fascinated by the ways of power and driven to exert his formidable energies and intelligence to become the recognized success in law and business, leading citizen of Amherst, the leader of the parade, but ultimately pinched and lonely, his dry, the unemotional manner in stark and chosen contrast to the booming juiciness of his spirit-ridden father. But he has whimsies too. 
as in the time that he leapt out of bed in the middle of the night to ring the church bells so that all citizens could wake and come see the display of the northern lights that were riddling the horizon. <laughs> there is mother, diffident and withdrawn, a sallow, silent soul who will provide the comforts of home, cakes of new maple sugar, polished apples, anxious goodwill for her children, but then disappear into the shadows. One can barely see her, this Emily Norcross Dickinson. Her light shines so faintly. Emily tells us that her life is tranquil but trifling. My mother does not care for thought. She reads a little, sleeps much, and reminds one of Hawthorne's blameless ship that forgot the port. <laughs> <laughs> the shadows shift. The children come, firstborn Austin, followed by Emily in 1830, completed by Lavinia. Vital, independent children who found much comfort and support in each other, each in some way married to the other, and but for a few short years, never more than a few feet away from each other until the day they died. It is in the main a lonely household, bound, as Lavinia tells us, to those to whom you gave loyalty and devotion, but with whom you did not share your thoughts. We see the whole pa family passing through the doors, friendly and absolute monarchs, each in his own domain. We watch the children grow from infancy. There is little touching of them and small communication. Father is distant, aloof except for his sonorous reading of the Bible. Mother withholds communication. The words that are exchanged are precious jewels to be hoarded and never squandered. Starved for language, Emily becomes an imagizer, valuing seeing over speaking. Speaking and writing is second best. Here's Emily at 14 writing to her bosom friend, Abaya Root. I long to see you, dear Abaya, and speak with you face to face, but so long as bodily interviewed is denied us, we must make letters answer though it is hard for friends to be separated. Do write me soon, or I cannot see you. I, I must hear from you often, often, very often. Again and again, her letters are filled with longing for sight. I grow too eager to see you. It's been a long week, dear, for I've not seen your face. Shall I indeed behold you? I would whisper to you in the evening of many and curious things, and by the lamp eternal read your thoughts and responses in your face and find what you thought about me. Our eyes would whisper for us. We would not ask for language. The house moves to another house for some years, but it brings itself along. It carries the mighty cast of a nursery culture, utterly safe, safe even to make a career of being a child. <laughs> How to grow up, I don't know, says Emily. I wish we were children, always. And when she's grown, she has one prayer. Dear Lord, make me a child. And in many ways, Emily stays a child, a cunning, knowing little fighter against the size and importance of the big folks and the big male god. She thumbs her nose against the whole overgrown and decaying lot of them. <laughs> many nursery rhymes tell us how wise a child she was and how widely she observed the genius of childhood and the unfairness with which it is treated. Later, when as a spinster woman, she went unseen and unesteemed by the prosy conscience of her society, she took comfort in her child, kept knowing that they shut me up in prose as when a little girl. They put me in the closet because they liked me still. Still could themselves have peeped and seen my brain so round they might as well have lodged a bird for treason in the pound. As adolescent's brother Austin reproved her for being too loud in her use of language, he tired of her living in metaphor. Young Emily responded in a parody of obligingness. I'll be a little ninny, a little pussy catty, a little red riding hood. With the innocent stance of a child, she blasphemes freely. What is paradise? Who lives there? Are they farmers? Do they hoe? Do they know that this is Amherst and that I'm coming to? Do they wear new shoes in Eden? Is it always pleasant there? Won't they scold us when we're homesick? 
or tell God how cross we are. You are sure there's such a person as a father in the sky? Mm -hmm. So if I get lost there ever, or do what the nurses call die, mm -hmm. I shan't walk the Jasper barefoot. Ransom folks won't laugh at me. Maybe Eden ain't so lonesome as New England used to be. <laughs> Very early in childhood. Oh my God, it's very, very, very early in childhood, Emily begins her war with God. Of course I prayed. <laughs> and did God care? He cared as much as on the air a bird had stamped her foot and cried, Give me. <laughs> Emily's father in heaven is an archetypal Yankee, a thrifty deity who is no fun. He is the playground bully flexing his religious muscles, beating his divine chest, and lording it over the smaller children. <laughs> she, on the other hand, would do a much better job if she were God. That's why they have to keep her out of heaven. Why do they keep me out of heaven? Why do they shut me out of heaven? Did I sing too loud? But I can say a little minor the song, timid as a bird. Wouldn't the angels try me just once more, just see if I troubled them, but don't shut the door. Oh, if I were the gentleman in the white robe, and they were the little hand that knocked, could I forbid? As a child in childhood, and as a childlike woman, she gloried in her small size and the capacity to turn her apparent insignificance into creative power, as many heroic children do, by the way. I was the slightest in the house. I took the smallest room. At night, my little lamp and book and one geranium. <laughs> now, we find that in, she has many poems, but in 226 poems, she uses the word little. <laughs> and in many more, refers to slight, low, and small. But then, she outwits all giants. I took my power in my hand and went against the world. Twas not so much as David had, but I was twice as bold. I aimed my pebble by myself. Was all the one that fell? Was it Goliath was too large? Or myself? Or was myself too small? Now you have to remember that 19th century writing at the same time is turning out the great classics of the genius of childhood. Consider, for example, Peter Pan, the story of the boy who refuses to grow up. Alice in Wonderland a small girl who is manipulated but remains unafraid of a world of absurd and paradoxical grown-ups. And of course, best of all, perhaps, Huckleberry Finn. The story of a boy who refuses to be civilized and by following his adolescent bliss, repudiates and shows up the adult society of his time for the sham it really is. Now, early in life, <clears throat> Emily learned that the little girl's voice was indispensable for possibility, that it was not simply a matter of preserving the rebelliousness and fantasy life of childhood, but that the great eye and ear of a child, her litmus mind and spirit, held the capacity to know the world and its folly further and deeper than the matured one did. We can only surmise from this that Emily's childhood gave her gifts of knowing and perception which she maintained all her life and were a sure source of the immensity of her creativity. I mean, when you really look at a child's perception, the nature of it is they are unbounded from the creative matrix which is going on beneath the surface crust of consciousness, but it's there all the time. Also, we must remember <clears throat> that a great deal of creativity has to do with the powers of identification, the capacity to take on the existence of another, be it an object or a dog or a cat or a person. And this, Emily Dickinson, with her diaphanous ability to become what she behold. Remember the great child man, Walt Whitman, said that, I become what I behold about the same time. She could take it on, be it an, you know, whatever it was. She did this supremely well. So well, in fact, that she often seemed to hold the gift of identity higher than the gift of poetry. I would not paint a picture 
I'd rather be the one. It's bright impossibility to dwell delicious on and wonder how the fingers feel whose rare celestial stir evokes so sweet a torment, such sumptuous despair. I would not talk like coronets. I'd rather be the one raised softly to the ceilings and out and easy on. Through villages of ether, myself endured balloon by but a lip of metal the peer to my pontoon. Nor would I be a poet, its finer own the ear, enamored, impotent, ear content, the license to revere, a privilege so awful. What would the dower be? And here's one of her greatest lines. Had I the art to stun myself with bolts of melody. <laughs> so with her gifts for incarnation, <laughs> she gained the art to stun not just herself, but everybody else as well. Well, then there came the school days. We watched the child Emily go to school, and our hearts are in our mouth. Will they ruin her, we wonder? Will they force her brilliant lights to be hidden under the bushel of the four R's? Religion, religious reading, religious writing, and religious arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if you can't guess what that means, it's be showing the, the geometries of God. Or will she be led astray, as Lewis Carroll so beautifully put it, by studies and ambition, distraction, uglification, and derision. <laughs> but not to worry, Grandfather Dickinson has sowed the seeds of a forward-looking curriculum at Amherst Academy, where, I quote, daughters could be well instructed. The female mind, he had written, so sensitive, so susceptible of improvement, <laughs> should not be neglected. God hath designed nothing in vain. <laughs> well, science, science turns out to be the core of Emily's studies, and she's well pleased. We have a very fine school, she writes to a friend. I have four studies. They are mental philosophy, geology, Latin, and botany. How large they sound, don't they? In the same letter, 14-year-old Emily declares, I am growing handsome. Very fast indeed. I suspect I shall be the belle of Amherst when I reach my 17th year. <laughs> well, her 17th year finds her at Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, <laughs> where she resides for a year studying chemistry, electricity, physiology, botany, algebra, and Euclid, all well-dosed with religious dogma, which she manages to separate out in her mind. Why, we wonder, did Emily get more science and math then in school rather than, than we do now. Mm -hmm. It is because the Amherst Trinitarians thought that there were deep spiritual connections between science and religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the evangelical ministers who made up the bulk of the teachers lectured and preached about God as the master craftsman and the supreme scientist of the universe. His face was to be discovered through natural laws. And young Emily looked at all this scientific theophany, theophany and said, no doubt, but what about all the annihilation and extinction that the great artificer plots in his workshop? It's easy to invent a life. God does it every day. Creation but the gamble of his authority. It's easy to efface it. The thrifty deity could scarce afford eternity to spontaneity. The perished patterns murmur but his perturbless plan proceed inserting here a son and there leaving out a man. <laughs> at, Mount, at Mount Holyoke, the pressure on her was continues to undergo conversion to this deity whom she found wildly capricious and less than human. The students that were divided into those with hope those who'd accepted conversion, and those without hope. <laughs> the category that uh, Emily valiantly stayed in. Often when many of her classmates were sitting together and then asked to stand up if they had given their life to God, she was the only one left sitting. <laughs> she wrote in a letter. They thought it queer. I didn't rise. I thought a lie would be queer. <laughs> well, after a while, she couldn't stand it, and she left Mount Holyoke for life in Amherst, where life bubbled and burned brightly. She writes, there's something going on in Amherst almost all of the time. 
such as shows, concerts, Uncle Tom's Cabin, perfor performed uh, uh, musters, festivals, fairs, lyceums, exhibitions, lectures, commencements, and cattle shows. By 1855, a father had bought the old homestead back, but even before that, their home had become the center of the social life of Amherst. <coughs> An 18-year-old Emily was in the thick of it. Amherst, yeah, she writes, Amherst is alive with fun this winter. Might you be here to see? Sleigh rides are as plenty as people. Parties can't find fun enough because all the best ones are engaged to attend balls a week beforehand. Bows can be had for the taking. Maids smile like the mornings in June. Oh, a very great town is this. Well, one's life is continuously touched with courtship and romance. While I washed the dishes at noon in that little sink room of ours, I heard a well-known rap, and a friend I love so dearly asked me to ride in the woods with him, the sweet, still woods, and I wanted to exceedingly. I told him I could not go, and he said he was disappointed. He wanted me very much. She's at the center of secrets. I am confided in by one and despised by another <coughs> and another still. And yet, in one way or another, everybody is available to her. Life is a constant show, a constant opportunity to observe and psychologize the world, a constant training in human hope and human folly. Our house is crowded daily with the members of this world, the high and the low, the bond and the free, the poor and the world's goods, and the almighty dollar. Father Dickinson becomes active in politics, is elected to the Massachusetts State Legislature, and when Emily is 24, she visited him in Washington after he'd been elected to Congress. There is little in her life to indicate that soon she will turn her back on all this, rarely, living, rarely leaving her father's house, rarely going outside the boundaries of her conservatory, her sunny upstairs room, the garden that sloped gently downhill to the east, and the orchard where the noiseless noise was. Home was so agreeable, she said. Why would anyone want to go away? So that nurtured by such a home, she'll be free to live in the vastness of her own mind, visiting with the enormous populace that resides there. Mm -hmm. The only news I know is bulletins all day from immortality. <laughs> The only shows I see, tomorrow and today, perchance eternity. And as she withdrew more and more into her mind and inner perceptions, they became almost painfully acute, so that the world passing outside her window has as much effect on her as if she were living in the midst of it, only more so. Friday, I tasted life. She writes about one of these occasions. It was a vast morsel. A circus passed the house. Still, I feel the red in my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, these tastes echoed ever after as analogies for everything else she thought about. Menagerie to me, my neighbors be. <laughs> and the steady stream of books and magazines of Shakespeare and Emerson and Thoreau and Dickens and Mrs. Browning that passed through the Dickinsonian household made her drunk with stimulation. Strong draughts of their refreshing minds to drink enable mine. Through desert or wilderness has bore its sealed wine to go elastic. But before we pursue one of the most hypersensitive and therefore hyperstimulated minds of all time, let us inquire further about what might have driven this girl who by all accounts greatly enjoyed social occasions and the constant presence of warm friends and family to remove herself so thoroughly from what once she had known. Now, I actually believe that it had to do with her response to the phenomenon of conversion. Mm. Now, to begin with, it's, it's hard for us to realize how constant, indeed, how intimate was the presence of death in those days. I mean, most children could not expect to pass the age of eight. The age of eight. Only one in four, a child's physiology text of the time says, lives to see 21. Mm. 
The Angel of Death, or variations on the skeletal form of the Grim Reaper, was one of the principal forms of art practiced in post New England towns. People actually went to cemeteries to admire the art of death on the headstones, the way Europeans went to museums. Hmm. And um, I, I remember once in, I was in Virginia in an old, very old church at Arden, and I found the headstone of one of my ancestors, early 18th century, <laughs> the woman. And she had had written on her headstone, I told you I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> practiced by white men was far, far, far more primitive than that practiced by the Native American theaters whom they had driven out of the land. <coughs> and it was the great interim, interim period between the women's medicine of herbs and salves and natural unguents gone underground with the witch scare and a remarkably impotent and harrowing practice by male doctors. There were no antibiotics, all surgery was performed with neither anesthesia nor antiseptics. Each muddy, cold, septic, and sewage-ridden house, most of which emptied near the well, was privy to the inevitable invasion by typhoid, pneumonia, smallpox, cholera, malaria, and above all, consumption, the last of which took off a fair sampling of Emily's close childhood friends before they reached their 20th year. Childbirth was a disaster, and the arrival of a newborn was almost always met with tentative joy, since chances were the infant would soon be carried off by some ailment which today would be met by a very simple treatment. So as you know, children's nighttime <coughs> prayers were filled with the expectation that they would not wake up out of their beds in the morning. Now I lay down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Now, part of women's work, but it was thought they would rise up in the morning and eternity. You know, so part of women's work was to participate in the long watches over the dying. And Emily had more than her share in this. There was no rationale for all this death, and the sheer inevitability of it gave rise among all folk, the educated as well as the uneducated, to the need for conversion. Conversion as a state of mind in which one could find hope in utter submission to the inscrutable will of God. So revivals were the great spiritual pastime of the 19th century uh, until after the Civil War and conversion experiences were their orgiastic form. <clears throat> Remember that in the 19th century uh, America, conversion was the communally recognized public rite of passage, you know, it was the major ritual. Now, for example, a great deal of it, I'm speaking from America, certainly England too, or Canada, uh, is sport. It is the organized public ritual. I mean, America take football. I mean, 11 young heroes carrying the holy egg through the womb of the goalpost. Their socks, virgins, dance and scream on the side. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, with, with puberty rights largely lost or greatly diminished, I mean, you witnessed the attempts of Mark Twain to revive them. Conversion, especially, was the way in which to move from youth to maturity. In conversion, everything in one's identity that you called your own was shifted, lifted up, and given over to God. Total loss of independence and autonomy, wherein an individual's control over the organization of his or her own experience given over to the Lord. So the integrated vision of the world that had united a unique set of memories and values and emotions into a coherent self was replaced by the uniform, divinely dictated vision of a world renewed in Christ's love. Uh, but what one gained in emotional enjoyment and certainty one lost in spiritual autonomy and personal identity. Many people, women especially, 
became bondswomen to the church and its directors. After conversion, one could find oneself lobotomized as to normal responses to death and dying, you see. One would accept with meek equanimity the incomprehensible will of the deity and the horrors of everyday dying. Instead, one would put aside sorrow and grief for the glory of certainty of the resurrection of the dead. Dying was but the supreme way of going home. The radical recasting or deconstructing of the self necessary for conversion was the principal aim of the revivalist experience, you see. Uh, one of the most important use of the imageries at that time was the imagery of Jacob wrestling with the angel. You know. mm -hmm. The experience was a radical restructuring, in our understanding in modern neurological terms, of the brain, mind, and emotional systems in which the local self and its individual and independent characteristics went into abeyance, often during the course of the fervor and the fever of the revivalist process, and was replaced by the collective self of the Christian soul, with its emphasis on meekness, humility, passivity, and utter submission to authority and to love. We must not forget that those calling their listeners conversion promised them an eternity of living with God's perfect love and companionship. How thrilling, how seductive that must have seemed to the unmarried and the ill-married. <coughs> One entered into intimacy with the archetype, but again, in the revivalist experience, at what a price. This was no deepening into relationship with the beloved. This was all out submission to a particular theology and psychological straitjacket. Well, in the midst of all this, <coughs> Emily from Shotwood, virtually to the day she died, was cajoled, commanded, exhorted to convert. But always she refused, refusing even to go to the revival meetings being held. She said, I felt that I was so easily excited that I might be deceived and I dared not trust myself. <laughs> Yet even she felt some indescribable longing for this golden opportunity. At the age of 15, she writes, I feel that I am sailing upon the brink, brink of an awful precipice from which I cannot escape and over which I fear my tiny boat will soon glide if I do not receive help from above. There is now a revival in college and many hearts have given way to the claims of God. Her refusal was a stupendous act of the assertion of her own identity. For as Jane Langton, who has written several marvelous mysteries with Emily Dickinson, critical to their theme, writes, it is impossible now to imagine the pressure against which she stood, stood fast. The power and influence ranged against her in a town like Amherst, where the church loomed so large where the clergyman was a man of supreme importance, where sermons were the matter of daily comment. And so, and of course, I, I say that in her refusal lay the source of the deepening of her genius and her skill with words. She deepened into her own word instead of capitulating to someone else's. She discovered her own lexicon, her own scripture, instead of becoming just another nameless bondswoman of holy writ. Indeed, I may say, she writ her own holy and, yes. and borrowed the images of the Bible to seed her own scripture. She firmly refused to be sucked into an ordained and finished word of God, however authoritative and ancient it might be. She danced with the angel rather than fighting with it, and she never seemed to stop dancing. And so the angel never went away became her partner, not her contender. Because she refused conversion, this hypersensitive, poetic, and psychological genius who desperately wanted to believe she had to take on God and reinvent the world, which is just what she did. I mean, I know of few cases in history where one has agreed to so great a challenge has agreed, in fact, to wrestle with the angel, not for a night, but for 55 years, and won. I mean, it gives a whole new slant to the notion of creativity. Yes. Now, of course, you couldn't leave your house much in such an enterprise. <laughs> I mean, it took all your time, space, and focus. So when I read these psychiatric diagnostic accounts written by men, 
attributing the whole of her work and genius to the annals of spinster sexual frustration. <laughs> I wonder at how distant and compartmentalized science has grown from human understanding. Because when you read Emily from inside out, you are reading woman's fecundity, not frustrated, but turned to world making. Yeah. This is the stuff of goddesses, once and future goddesses. True, she still views the Christian imagery of her culture, baptism, uh, being confirmed, salvation, but she used it in the service of her own self-conversion to the mind and soul of goddess as creator. For example, listen to her wonderful words of self-confirmation, her own self-crowning as goddess queen. I am seated. I stopped being theirs. The name they dropped upon my face with water in the country church is finished using now. And they can put it with my dolls, my childhood, and the string of spools. I've finished threading, too. Baptized before without the choice, but this time consciously of grace unto supremest name, call to my full, the crescent dropped, existence whole arc filled up with one small diadem. My second rank, too small the first, crown crowing on my father's breast, a half-unconscious queen, but this time adequate, erect, uh, with will to choose or to reject, and I choose just a crown. So there. Wow. So you see, it is perhaps the most radical kind of choice one can make, the choice to be God. <laughs> it requires a different psychology, a different way of being, a very different language. It particularly requires a highly conscious relationship to one's own consciousness. It requires what she called the lunacy of light. Mm. Uh, a very dangerous human sanity that was at once a divine insanity. Mm. It required the consciousness of the creator, and that's just what she here was creation in its boldest and sometimes even biblical sense. For one thing, like God, she named things. Consider how much of her poetry is taken up by giving things names and qualities that exceed all previous knowing of them. See how she renames the seasons, for example, and brings new color, New England color and vitality into a tamed world. Take autumn. The name of it is autumn, the hue of it is blood, an artery upon the hill, a vein along the road. Oh. Great globules in the alleys, and oh, the shower of stain when winds upset the basin and spill the scarlet rain. Oh. Look what she does with definitions of strong feelings. Hope. Hope is a subtle glutton. He feeds upon the fair, and yet, inspected closely, what abstinence is there? Yeah. Or consider what she does with longing. Longing is like the seed that wrestles in the ground, believing if it intercede, it shall at length be found. Try her recreation of remorse. Remorse is memory awake. Her party's all astir, a presence of departed acts, a window and a door. Ooh. Or of decay. Crumbling is not an instance act, a fundamental pause, dilapidations processes, are organized decays. Experience. Experience is the angled road preferred against the mind. <laughs> Doom. Doom is the house without the door. It is entered from the sun, and then the ladder's thrown away because escape is done. Like a goddess, like a divine queen, an Isis revealed, stirring the pot, she cooks up a landscape with the power of imagination and, and reverie. I mean, listen to her recite her recipe for landscape building. Oh. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee. One clover and a bee, and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. <laughs> she begins to become exalted with her power. 
She not only competes with God, she beats him at his own game. Score, <laughs> Emily 2, God 1. <laughs> <laughs> I send two sunsets, Day and I, in competition ran. I finished two and several stars while he was making one. <laughs> his was on ampler, but as I was saying to a friend, mine is more convenient to carry in the hand. <laughs> Another aspect of God's is their drunkenness. Gods are those who live in a state of continuous intoxication over their creations or recreations. With Emily, the intoxication is caused by her revelation, her revealing of nature. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankard scooped in pearl. Not all the vats upon the Rhine yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of air am I, and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. Everything in nature roils with significance. A bird's squandered note upon the air causes the universe to quake from the importance of its song. The fact is that earth is heaven, whether heaven is heaven or not. And what does it matter for one whose closest friend is eternity? Behind me dips eternity. Before me, immortality, myself, the term between. She will invest the term between with totality. She will put her circumference around it. What happens when you take on the spirit of creation and yet are caught in the term between, caught in your own hard shell of mortality? What happens if, like Emily, your mind exceeds the continuum of day, night, day, night, day, night, day, night. Are you then claustrophobic before the wheeling of the sky, the circling of the seasons? The only thing to do is to put one circumference around it, to invest all things with what we might think of as holonomic knowing. This is a knowing. This is a knowing that sees the before and after and the in-between of things that catches the glint of glory and the shadows skittering in the corner. The mind wraps itself around its object like a python, but instead of suffocating, it gives it life. Python comes also a pythia, just there in Greece, the pythia, the one who could bring through the words of the god. You know. And on this earth, heaven, this earth heaven, everything is connected with everything else. Again, God's known. So the presence of heaven on earth is so acute to be almost unbearable. And those great lines, beauty crowds me till I die, beauty, mercy have on me, but if I expire today, let it be in sight of thee. In a delightful book, The Transcendental Murders, <coughs> Jane Langton suggests a possible romantic attachment between Emily Dickinson and Henry Thoreau, although there's not a shred of actual evidence to suggest that they ever met each other. But their sentiments were marvelously close. I mean, there he was in Concord, a mere 60 miles away, equally intoxicated, equally ravished by him, <coughs> him, to have such sweet impressions made on us, such ecstasy begotten of the beat breezes, there comes into my mind such an indescribably infinite, all-observing, divine, heavenly pleasure, a sense of evil elevation and expansion. I was daily intoxicated, and yet no man could call me intemperate. Thoreau was often surprised to find himself alone in his intoxication, to discover that Concord's sturdy farmers were still sober. He alone was the self-appointed inspector of snowstorms and rainstorms, going about his business early. It is true, I never assisted the sun materially in his rising, but doubt not, but doubt not it, was of the last, it was of the last importance only to be present at it. So like Thoreau, Emily Dickinson felt the importance of her solitary witness. Nature, she said, plays without a friend. The sun went down, no man looked on, the earth and I alone were present at the majesty. Naturally then, both find themselves never less at leisure than when at leisure, and less alone than when alone. As Thoreau himself remarked, why should I feel lonely? Is not our planet in the Milky Way? <laughs> now, both Emily and Thoreau 
pour the revelations into writing, he into precise descriptions of nature as he found it in, you know, many of you read it, Walden Pond, Flint Pond, Fairhaven Bay. She into miraculous poetic recreations of sunsets, bird-like bees, butterflies, all manner of nature's manifold life. We like March. His shoes are purple. He is new and high. Makes he mud for dog and peddler, makes he forest dry. Knows the adder's tongue his coming and begets her spot. Stands the sun so close and mighty that our minds are hot. God stains the mind with glory. 1861 to 1863, something remarkable happens to Emily. Torrents of perfection in the form of madly original letters, magnificently inventive poems pour out of her. Why, in the year 1862, at the age of 31, she writes a poem, generally a masterpiece, for 366 days of the year. Something happened to Emily. And of course, the popular literary notion is that she fell in love. I mean, there are reams of pages, caches of clinical studies, whole gardens of unread doctoral dissertations <laughs> devoted to speculation as to he or they, or in several feminist critics, she really, she really was. Was there one love or many, or was Emily simply in love with all and everything most of the time? What happened to this woman, self-described as a wayward nun, to cause her write, to write some of the most excruciatingly true and poignant love poetry and love letters of her time. What happened to turn her into a cornucopia of invention? Not that this phenomenon has not happened many times before. <coughs> Witness Froome, witnessed to some extent, Goethe, certainly Shakespeare, Dante. Love and creativity, the way that do cause an eruption of invention and knowing. Love is, uh, is an altered state that renews the seeing of the mind, the responsiveness of the body, the energy of all circuits in a state of being in love. All systems, quite simply, are on go. Now, the extant material on Emily Dickinson's love life is skimpy, to say the least. There was actually a, probably a great deal, but they burned it because they thought it was too much, you know, so it did not get into the public. There are three letters to someone she calls master, and they are wondrous strange. I mean, imagine being the object of Emily Dickinson's Vesuvial affection <laughs> and receiving a letter like this. Master, if I wish with a might, I cannot repress that mine were the queen's place. The love of the Plantagenet is my only apology to come nearer than presbyteries and nearer than the new coat that the tailor made. The prank of the heart at play on the here in whole holy holiday is forbidden me. Would Daisy disappoint you? No, she wouldn't, sir. It were comfort forever just to look in your face while you looked in mine. Then I could play in the woods till dark. Mm. And from this follows a torrent of elegant and sensual verses enshrining romance and passion. She thinks of herself as the daisy following the sun, the adored sun. The daisy follows soft the sun, and when his golden walk is done, sits shyly at his feet. He, waking, finds the flower there. Wherefore, marauder, art thou here? Because, sir, love is sweet. We are the flower, thou the sun. Forgive, of, forgive us, as if, if as days decline, we nearer steal to thee, enamored of the parting west, the peace, the flight, the amethyst, night's possibility. Like a daisy, she is utterly tropistic for her love. To love him, it is almost a reflex. We gather that whoever this master was, he wrote to her in bewilderment why she should love him. Her answer is enshrined in one of the greatest poems ever of the irrational givenness of the one in love, the absolute subjection to the beloved. Why do I love you, sir? Because the wind does not require the grass to answer. Wherefore, when he passes, she cannot keep her place. The lightning never asked an eye, wherefore it shut when he was by, because he knows it cannot speak in reasons not contained of talk, there be preferred by date here folk. The sunrise, sir, compelleth me, because he sunrise, and I see, therefore then I love thee. Well, the ardor just continues to grow, Emily. She becomes obsessed, smitten, 
utterly given over to thoughts of him. She even envies the fly upon his window pane mm -hmm. and wishes to be with him always, forever at his side to walk, the smaller of the two, brain of his brain, blood of his blood, two lives, one being now. Well, she crosses the mid-Victorian line into a dimension of eros left unexpressed largely by poets of the time. There is no question that something of her poems of this period are immensely erotic and sexually explicit. Come slowly, Eden, lips unused to thee, bashful sip thy jessamines as the fainting bee, reaching late his flower, Round her chamber hums, counts his nectars, enters, and is lost in bombs. Or consider this little wayward nun's extraordinary imagery in Wild Nights. Wild Nights, Wild Nights, were I with thee. Wild ni Nights should be our luxury. Futile the winds to a heart in port, done with the compass, done with the chart, rowing in Eden, ah, the sea, might I but more tonight in thee. Oh. <laughs> Who did she feel so volcanically potent about? Who? Because when goddesses love, they don't mess about. <laughs> Sometimes, something it was the brilliant Philadelphia minister and orator Charles Wadsworth, a happily married man whom she met on a number of occasions and whom she corresponded with over the years on spiritual matters. However, we know that she secreted letters to him, perhaps of a very different persuasion, in envelopes addressed to others. Others suspect that the master letters were really addressed to the wonderfully handsome and ebullient Samuel Bowles, the editor of the Springfield Republican, who was interested in her work, although he didn't understand it, and he published a number of her poems. He too was married, but his wife was exhausted after uh, Ten children. <clears throat> and it was to him that she spoke of her willingness to wait until joined with him in death in one of the most curious poems in the Emily Connection. Title divine is mine, the wife without the sign. <laughs> Acute degree conferred on me, Empress of Calvary, royal all but the crown, betrothed without the swoon. God sends us women when you hold garnet to garnet, gold to gold. Born bridal shrouded in a day, try victory. My husband, women say, stoking the melody, is this the way? <laughs> Married men were safe. With them, Emily could enjoy the imagination of love, the little, the title of a uh, divine, a wife without the worry and the bother of the sign. She remained, however, in a state she described as snow where any actual <coughs> physical expression was concerned. Indeed, when Bowles came to visit her, after a long absence in which he'd been very sick, she refused to come downstairs, much to the consternation of her family and sister. Instead, she sent him a note from her place upstairs. I cannot see you. You will not less believe me that you return to us alive is better than a summer, and to hear your voice below the news of any bird. On another occasion, however, he came to see her, and again she refused to come downstairs, whereupon he shouted up the stairs, Emily, you damn wretch! No more of this nonsense. I've traveled all the way from Springfield to see you. Come down at once. Whereupon she came, and her conversation was reported to have never been more witty. So there. <laughs> her love, we gather, was not returned, and she suffered as only Emily could. Those who love greatly always suffer in equal measure. Here's a poem to the one she loves, but who probably does not return her affections. You left me, sire, two legacies, a legacy of love. A heavenly father would suffice had he the offer of. You left me boundaries of pain, capacious as the sea between eternity and time, your consciousness and me. Whatever or whoever the object of her fierce affection was, her state of mind and expression was compounded by her adversarial relationship to God. And this anger brought out the ghoul in Emily, something that has caused one recent authoress, I believe it was Camille Paglia, to refer to her as the Madame de Sade of Amherst. She dares God to take her on his 
uh, take her on in his most surgical <coughs> role. <coughs> Rearrange a wife's affections when they dislocate my brain. <coughs> Amputate my freckled bosom. Make me bearded like a man. <laughs> she is separated from the beloved by the jealous God. And she responds in a macabre satire of Christ's nailed feet. <clears throat> After telling how God took away our eyes and put us far apart, she tells how they summoned us to die with sweet alacrity. We stood upon our stapled feet, condemned, but just to see. Her valentines are ingenious if grotesque boasts. The largest woman's heart could hold an arrow too. She, and she rages, rages at mortality, the fact that a single screw of flesh is all that pins the soul. Incarnation in human form is, for a goddess, a perpetual torment. The butterfly, the psyche, psyche means butterfly in Greek, which is uh, pinned to the wall by the lepidopterous god, the lepidopterous. And as for God, in her anger, she commits mayhem on him as well. For as the dying once went to God's right hand, right, ghost right hands, that hand is amputated now, and God cannot be found. <laughs> this is the dead hand of the law of old Calvinism, devoid of moral substance. In another poem, she uses the amputated hand in a way reminiscent of Poe. Of heaven above the firmest proof, we fundamental know, except for its marauding hand, it had been heaven below. After the experience with love, Emily shows two natures, both of them heated up, one serene, the other very savage. Lightning sears saplings, Volcanoes eat villages for breakfast. Nature's lips are hissing corals that open and shut as cities ooze away. Civilization liquefies at nature's touch. And she exclaims profanely to the wintry god, go manacle your icicle against your tropic bride. Then blithely she tries to forgive him. Heavenly Father, we apologize to thee for thine own duplicity. <laughs> I mean, there's a tremendous history of blasphemy and invective with a human creative consciousness. Well, her love was surely returned by one person, a newly made widower, Judge Otis Phillips Lord of Salem, when she was 46 and he 65. He had been a friend of the family for many years, but upon his wife's death, a most passionate correspondence followed. <coughs> the fact that this exchange of love letters follows so quickly upon the death of his wife in a time when the dead are sanctified and memorialized for a very long time suggests that both parties felt very strongly for some time. Take this letter of 1878. My lovely Salem smiles at me. I seek his face so often, but I have done with guises, suggesting she concealed her love for some time. She continued. I confess that I love him. I rejoice that I love him. The exultation floods me. I cannot find my channel. The creek turns sea at thought of thee. Incarcerate me in yourself, rosy penalty, threading with you this lovely maze which is not life or death, though it has the intangibleness of one and the flush of the other, waking for your sake on day made magical with you before I went, my darling. Come, oh, be a patriot now. Love is a patriot now, gave her life for its country. Has it meaning now? O oh, nation of the soul, thou hast thy freedom now. Rough drafts of all but 15 letters remained. There were hundreds and hundreds of others. They were destroyed. And of these drafts, all were, as I said, even what remained highly edited by her estate, lest the general populace catch on to the unvarnished passion of Emily, set free and running wild in the orchards of love. And Judge Lord, she discovered an intelligence and a capacity for passion that could match her own. Evidently, the relationship assumed the proportion of 12th century courtly love, full of passion, of looking and poetic expression that was allowed, but we got it was never consummated. Lord wanted to marry Emily, she refused. She had lived so long a recluse in her own private domain. It is doubtful she could have ever made a bride. Also, she was the nurse and companion for her mother for many years. She suffered a stroke in 1875, completely incapacitated, and took seven years to die. But whatever the reason, one after another, 
the major friendships and passionate relationships of Emily Dickinson's life, all confirmed her deepest conviction where passion is concerned, there must be separation. And I also believe that her refusal is bound up with her larger refusal to live in the world of the God of her fathers, in her great lines to him, I believe. I cannot live with you. It would be life. And life is over there, behind the shelf. I could not die with you, for one must wait to shut the other's gaze down. You could not. Nor could I rise with you, because your face would put out Jesus that new grace, because you saturated sight, and I had no more eyes for sordid excellence as paradise. And were you lost, I would be, though my name rang loudest on the heavenly fame. And, and were you saved, and I condemned to be, where you were not, that self were hell to me. So we must meet apart, you there, I here, with just the door ajar that oceans are, and prayer and that white sustenance, despair. And as we know, almost nothing of her, hers was published in her lifetime, seven poems in all, most of them published anonymously. The male editors of magazines would not, could not understand her. At the time of her greatest need, when she was, for a period of a year, suffering from a disorder in her eyes and getting no return to her love letters, she read an article in the Atlantic Monthly by Thomas Wentworth Higginson, which was written as an encouragement to any mute, inglorious Miltons who were reading the journal. He was astonished, as he said, by the wonderful effusions that landed on his desk. But the most wonderful of all was the letter from Emma that began, are you too deeply occupied to say if any of my verse is alive? Higginson wrote back, and their correspondence lasted for the rest of her life. As an advisor, sadly, he failed her. He found her poems too bizarre, advised her not to publish. But at least she found a willing listener, uh, listener in her literary work. She called him her preceptor. She told him that his correspondence to her was like a hand stretched to her in the dark. What is it, what is it for a vastly creative person who practices her art with diligence never to be seen or known? At a certain point, they fall into either numbness or raging pain. I wrote a letter to the world that did not answer me. I tie my hat. I crease my shawl. Life's little duties do precisely, as the very least were infinite to me. I put new blossoms in the glass and throw the old away. I push a petal from my gown that anchored there. I weigh the time to be six o'clock. I have so much to do. And yet, existence, some way back, stopped, struck my ticking through. How do you survive with such ingrown passion and despair if you're a genius? You do what Emily finally did. You craft your life to become a myth. In 1881, young Mabel Loomis Todd had been living for two months in Amherst, where her husband was appointed head of the college observatory, went on November the 6th, 1881, she wrote her parents an excited letter about the town's most interesting citizen. I must tell you about the, the character of Amherst. It is a lady whom the people call the myth. She is a sister of Mr. Dickinson and seems to be the climax of all the family oddity. She has not been seen outside of her own house in 15 years except once to see a new church when she crept out at night and viewed it by moonlight. No one who calls upon her mother and sister ever see her, but she allows the little children to come once in a great while and when her time to come in when she gives them cake or candy or some nicety, for she is very fond of the little ones. But more often she lets down the sweet meat by a string out the window to them. She dresses wholly in white and her mind is said to be perfectly wonderful. She writes finely, but no one ever sees her. Her sister, who was at Mrs. Dickinson's party, invited me to come and sing to her mother sometime. People tell me the myth will hear every note. She will be near, but unseen. Isn't that like a book? So interesting. Mm -hmm. So interesting indeed, it became for Mabel Loomis Todd that she was the one who compiled and edited the first batch of Emily's poems for publication after her death. 
as well as later editions of her poems as they became available. The creation of one's life as a myth. So successful was it that her life as allegory may have been Emily's most successful poem, a series of mysteries which forever invite you to participate. Female mysteries at that, exploring the characteristics and constraints of 19th century womanhood so as to transform and even transcend them. I mean, that's the task of a mystery, to take one beyond, beyond the confines of one's little local self into the possibility of the universal self, the quantum self, the peer of God. The mysteries were the mystery of an intelligence that confounds local space and time and refuses confinement in that space and time. Tremendous. There are many of you here who participate in that, that you have a kind or a quality of intelligence that goes beyond your learning, your conditioning, your habits, that transcends your local space and time. Is that not so? Yes. Things occur to you. Things happen. You know, you know things. The mystery of the missing lover. And who is the lover? Because ultimately it is the, the lover. But it had to be directed toward people, or a passionate love of nature, which is sufficient, I suppose, because of a refusal of the of heaven, of the god of the time, you see. And finally, the mystery of the muse, the mystery of creation itself. In spite of being unpublished, Emily saw too that her poems and letters went winging everywhere. She writes to famous men and women, and they would be so bemused by her originality, they would all answer her. She daily wrote potent, loving letters to her sister-in-law, Sue Gilbert, who lived only 300 feet away. She wrote to a very famous novelist of the time, Helen Hunt Jackson. What did she write? It starts with L. Ramona. Hmm? Ramona. Ramona, yes, Ramona, yeah. Um, and it was Helen Hunt Jackson who alone among her correspondents recognized fully her genius. Again and again she asked for Emily's poems and urges her to publish. She says, it is a cruel wrong to your day and generation that will not give them light. And she rightly prophesies in the same letter, later generations will know all about you and your poems will reside in many, many hearts. Mm. It all ended finally in the mystery of death. Death, a theme that looms so large in Emily's thinking and writing. Death was her neighbor. There was a cemetery behind her house where she lived between the ages of 9 and 24. And funeral processions were the regular occurrence on the main street down from the window. All her life, she was forever predicting, anticipating, looking forward to her own death. She hoped that there was an in-between place when not quite alive and not entirely dead, that she would know everything that there is to know. That's a wonderful one. Death was the ultimate lover, the final mystery, the one who would finally seduce her, as she says in one of her grandest poems. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. <laughs> the carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. <laughs> We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children strove at recess in the ring. We passed the fields of gazing grain. We passed the setting sun, or rather, he passed us. The dews drew quivering and chill for only gossamer my crown, my tippet only tall. We passed before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the cornice in the ground. Since then, tis centuries, and yet feels shorter than the day. I first surmised the horses' heads were toward eternity. Mm -hmm. Emily died of Bright's disease on May 15, 1886. Her last letter, written a few hours before she died to her young relatives, went, Little cousins called back, Emma. <laughs> at her funeral, she looked wonderfully young and finally at peace. And within a few days, 
Her sister Lavinia opened her box of poems and discovered the priceless treasure hidden there. And Emily was launched again into the world and time, and poetry <coughs> turned a corner. She had wrestled long and hard with God and won. She gave a new ordering to reality and rewrote the priorities. She said, I reckon when I count at all, first poets, then the sun, then summer, then the heaven of God, and then the list, and then the list is done. <laughs> but looking back, the first so seems to comprehend the whole, the others look a needless show, so I write poets all. Wow. <laughs> Thank you.